Thank you so much for the kind introduction. My name is Dr. Vijay. I'm at Fox Chase Cancer Center, and today we'll talk all about carcinoid syndrome. So the main objectives of my talk are going to be centered around the causes and the symptoms of this disease and the syndrome, how do we diagnose it, how do we treat it, and then also a little bit about some special considerations based on all the questions that you have asked. So carcinoid syndrome is caused by hormones produced by neuroendocrine tumors. It is mostly due to the tumors in the liver and about 20 to 40% of neuroendocrine tumor patients experience this syndrome. There are about 40 different kinds of hormones implicated in this, and it is associated with some very specific but very diverse set of symptoms too. So let's look into them. So looking at the clinical symptoms associated with carcinoid syndrome, you see there are many different types of body systems affected. It can cause skin symptoms like the flushing, which is probably the most common symptom associated with carcinoid in about 85% of the patients. There are also some less common skin manifestations like dilated skin veins, bluish discoloration of fingertips, but that's much less common. The most likely hormone that mediates this symptom are the kinins and the histamines. On the contrast, if you look at the GI system, so the diarrhea and the cramp, which is the second most common symptom associated with the syndrome, is particularly mediated by serotonin hormone. And that some, some tumors produce serotonin and some others produce kinins more than the serotonin. And that decides what symptom a patient with carcinoid syndrome has. So some patients have flushing, but no diarrhea. Others have diarrhea, but no flushing, and some have both. There's also the effect on the heart in terms of valve defects and palpitations and respiratory issues with wheezing. Why is this important? You know, all these symptoms that happen with carcinoid syndrome, they very strongly affect a person's quality of life. So as you can see in this chart, it's a simple graph which shows that the total number of flushing episodes that somebody has, as they increase, the incidence of anxiety and depression go up because it reminds you of your cancer too and their physical functioning score goes down, and all of this strongly affects your overall quality of life. There are some other symptoms that are associated with carcinoid syndrome, but these are not likely related to the hormones. You know, symptoms like fatigue, pain, weight loss. These are probably results of the tumor growing. You know, these are symptoms that most patients have with tumors, and the treatment for these symptoms is geared towards controlling the tumor rather than controlling just the symptoms or the hormone secretions. There are some triggers of carcinoid syndrome. I'm sure you're all aware of the five E's that the way we call them. It can be alcohol, certain foods, so we call it eating, stress and release of epinephrine, or in general, epinephrine, like in, if you get it as anesthesia and stuff like that, exercise as well as emotions. So these are the five triggers. And some patients actually have to use short-acting or creotide analogs around these triggers so that it doesn't make them miserable. So let's talk about a little bit about the diagnosis of this disease. We all wish that diagnosis of carcinoid syndrome was as easy as diagnosing this swanoma that you see here. So, you know, you don't, and you just do tests to conform. Unfortunately, with carcinoid syndrome, it's not that easy. Here, the diagnosis of takes a long time and some patients takes up to eight or ten years before we finally find out what the problem is you know but clinical history is the key right someone suspects that you have carcinoid syndrome based on the symptoms you produce or provide them with and as a result do some other testing so the most common testing we do is some blood markers as you may be aware we, we test something in the urine called the 24r 5 hiaa this is um hormone that is a breakdown product of serotonin. It is very accurate. So in somebody who is suspected of having carcinoid diarrhea or carcinoid syndrome, the urine 5-HIAA is elevated in up over 90% of the patients. So if that is, that's a good you know, screening test. You have to remember that this test is affected by a lot of drugs and a lot of medications. So you have to avoid them for about 72 hours before. And it's much more sensitive for mid-gut carcinoid tumors because that's the type of tumor that produces the serotonin hormone. 
we use chromogranin A very widely, you know, primary care physicians and GI and even oncology, we all use it very often, but it's a very inaccurate test. In one study where half of the people with carcinoid had this test done and the other half were normal people, the levels actually were higher in normal people than they were in the carcinoid patients. So it's, it's not a very accurate test and slowly but surely is, is something that we are trying to, you know, decrease the use of. We have serotonin, you know, we can check that in blood and we do that many times, but it's not the best screening tool because it's a very fluctuating hormone. Platelets, you know, the cells in your blood that prevent bleeding also produce a lot of this hormone. And hence, we typically don't use it for diagnosis. We are trying to develop a plasma 5-HIAA test. It's actually investigational. It's some, something that is to be validated prospectively as in, in clinical trials. But that would be a very welcome test because then you don't have to collect urine for 24 hours. So if you ask me one test that should be done, it's the urine 5-HIAA. Once you have a test and you're concerned about carcinoid, you have to find where the tumor is. You do endoscopic evaluation of your GI tract, or you do CAT scans and MRIs. And we also do some special tests like the octreotide scans or the net spot or gallium dotatate PET scans. You know, these are the functional imaging technologies that have revolutionized how we treat the, and diagnose patients with this problem. The next slide here is a very interesting one suggesting the uh, efficacy and sensitivity of the two different types of functional imaging tests, the octreotide scan and the gallium PET scan or the uh, net spot scan as you know it. You can see the sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy of the gallium PET scan is very, very high. It was pretty good for the octreotide scan, but we got to another level with the use of these gallium dotatate PET scans. And the reason why to know that is important is because it helps in, in diagnosing patients much more accurately than we could like 10, 15 years ago. So this brings to an important question. There are some patients, you know, they have been reported to have carcinoid syndrome, which have all the symptoms. They may have elevated hormone levels too, but there is no tumor identified. It was treated anecdotally. Unfortunately, this was much more common in the past because we did not have good tests. I just showed you that slide, which says the gallium PET scans and all the testing we have available. We are able to diagnose patients very accurately. So even though we think that you can have syndrome in the absent of, absence of a visible tumor, it probably is likely related to underappreciation of metastatic disease, which in the current scenario is very unlikely. Because to have a carcinoid syndrome, you need to have a tumor that secretes the hormone. So in this current age, to have carcinoid syndrome without identifying a tumor is extremely rare. And you know we have to look for other causes which brings me to the next part of my discussion, which is what are the other causes of diarrhea in our patients? Okay. So you see carcinoid syndrome is the most common one. There are some others like bile salt diarrhea, which is related to removal of the gallbladder and surgery on the intestines. There are some treatments associated for that. Similarly, there's something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is related to the slow transit of food, and um, you know, from adhesions or scar tissue in patients who've had surgery, this can be treated with antibiotics. Patients who get treated with octreotide or lanreotide kinds of drugs for neuroendocrine tumors can develop deficiency of the pancreatic juices that digest the food. And this can cause diarrhea too. Similarly, you can still have celiac disease or the food intolerance despite having a diagnosis of NET. And that infectious diarrhea, you know, people getting and eating giardiasis or any of the other infections can also cause diarrhea. So it's not just one reason why somebody can get diarrhea and all these other things need to be ruled out. And for that, we require a very um, thorough GI evaluation. Looking at the flushing, it also has a lot of different causes why somebody can have that symptom. Carcinoid syndrome being the most common one, but there's also menopause and many times this problem is chalked up to this um, menopause diagnosis, but you have to rule out all the other causes too. You can have thyroid problems, some neurological disorders, alcohol or drug effects can cause it. There are some rare disorders in the mast cells that can cause it. 
and rarely some other types of cancers and a you know, skin problem called rosacea. These are just the differential diagnosis for flushing and they all need to be looked into when you're identifying a patient with carcinoid syndrome. Now, having said that, a typical history with some testing that we talked about is usually able to pinpoint the diagnosis. It's just because it is so rare, people look at that, you know, in this, in, if you look at the list, they look at CS as the last likelihood rather than the first one. So it takes a long time for somebody to diagnose it. But there's a lot more people who are educated and the level of awareness of this diagnosis is increasing thanks to all the work that has been done around it. And um, more and more people are diagnosing it faster than we you know, traditionally used to. So we've talked about how we diagnose it. Let's talk a little bit about how we treat carcinoid syndrome. So it's, it's intertwined with the treatment of the problem. So if someone has neuroendocrine tumor and you're treating their cancer by surgery, liver-directed therapy, medical you know, drug treatments, targeted radiotherapy, I know we've talked about all of these multiple you know, during, this, during the day, so I'm not going to belabor it. But obviously, if you control the tumor, the symptoms would get better. The next is to look at hormone control. Okay. Here, what we are mainly targeting is reduction in the hormone or the effect of the hormone, which is a treatment that is specific for patients who have carcinoid syndrome. So the medical therapy for hormonal control and carcinoid syndrome, you know, the timeline is shown on this slide very well. So in the 1980s, we had this new drug of creotide, which is a somatostatin analog, which was approved. Then we had nothing for 15 years. Then lenreotide came into the picture and then nothing again for a long time. And more recently, telotristat came into the picture. So we'll just talk a little bit about all of these. For somatostatin analogs, you know, I just put out the names of the articles. So as you can see, the first one was um, an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 1986, which basically suggested that long acting uh, somatostatin analog or octreotide is very effective in controlling the symptoms of carcinoid syndrome. Similarly, when lenreotide got approved, it got approved based on the study called the ELECT trial. And both of these drugs are so effective that they reduce symptoms in more than 80% of the patients. So that's a very good thing. So we have these drugs that can be used. Looking at the new kids on the block, we have um, octreotide, which is now available as a self-injecting multi-use pen, which can be used for severe diarrhea, flushing episodes, and breakthrough symptoms associated with carcinoid syndrome. So, you know, you don't have to like pull out a needle and draw out the medicine from a syringe, keep it refrigerated in the meantime, but this is like a self-injecting pen, makes it easier, just like you have insulin pens. And then there is this oral formulation of octreotide, which is being approved for acromegaly, another uh, disorder of the, um, of the growth of the body. But um, it's not approved for this disease yet, but it's something to look forward to in future. The next drug is this drug called telotristat. So we just talked about you know, the somatostatin analogs. The way they work is they block the release of these hormones, these active hormones from these neuroendocrine tumor cells. Now, one, what this drug does, telotristat, is even though, you know, you couldn't block the signal or if you block the signal, it wasn't sufficient enough, it basically blocks the production of the hormone serotonin physically. So the way you make serotonin in the body is you get sick, the, the neuroendocrine tumor cells get a signal, and then the tryptophan in those cells is converted into this drug called serotonin. And telotristat blocks it. Now, the serotonin is the way it goes into the blood, causes all the symptoms, and is filtered by the kidneys and excreted as this 5-HIAA. So this is, um, telotristat is a very effective drug that blocks the conversion of tryptophan to serotonin. So you have no serotonin, so the symptoms should get better. So in the large study, the phase three trial that studied the benefit of this drug found out that, if, as you can see in this, in this figure here, Patients who were taking the drug at two different doses, 250 milligram and 500, as denoted by the blue and the green graph um, marks, and then patients who were just taking a sugar pill, which is the top line, you see the incidence of diarrhea was lower when they took this pill than when they didn't. 
the difference was not as much as we would like it to be, but still there was a benefit in adding it or using it in conjunction with the somatostatin analogs is approved and is used by many doctors. Now, I want to take a second to talk about what serotonin syndrome is because it's a very interesting point, a question that was raised. Can carcinoid syndrome be related to serotonin syndrome? Because, you know, carcinoid syndrome is associated with elevate, elevated level of serotonin. So serotonin in the body is a feel-good hormone, okay? So what it does is it in the brain, it controls your mood. It also controls your body thermostat. Compared to it, when it's in the periphery, so in your rest of your body, it controls the movement of your intestines and all, you know, causing diarrhea and et cetera. The good part is that the serotonin of the brain cannot come across into your peripheral circulation and the serotonin that's circulating in the body cannot go to the brain because there is something called a blood brain barrier. All right. So the serotonin syndrome is caused by excessive serotonin in the brain which can cause extreme nerve cell activity leading to this problem. You know, the symptoms are more neurologic. You have shivering, some kind of diarrhea too, to very severe symptoms like rigidity in the muscles, fevers, convulsions, etc. And it, the most likely causes, there is some interaction between medications that you're taking or overdose, which leads to this problem. Now, you ask the serotonin level for carcinoid syndrome patients is really high. Why do they not get serotonin syndrome, right? Well, the reason is, as I told you, it's because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So they are functionally separate systems. And if you have higher levels or increased activity of the nerves because of serotonin activity in the brain, you get serotonin. You can get serotonin syndromes. In the peripheral system, elevated serotonin levels lead to carcinoid syndrome but have no effect on brain. So if you go back to, you know, looking at the drug I talked to you about, the telotristat, what it does is it prevents serotonin formation in the periphery. One concern initially was that this drug could cause depression because, as I told you, serotonin in the brain is a feel-good hormone. So if you take that away, it can cause depression. Interestingly, the amount of transfer or the crosstalk between the brain and the periphery is very little, so you don't get as many symptoms, and the incidence of clinical depression was very low and really didn't even need treatment on that trial. So he, I think we are done here. So I wanna thank you. Um, these are um, Steve Jobs, you guys know about. The uh, second one is Irfan Khan. He died of a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor in India, was a very um, gifted actor in the Indian scenario, I would say. So thank you everybody. <laughs>